Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. We have a full house here today. We have four little Hollywood squares or blocks, I guess. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And joining me is Colby Pitts, who is the Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator and one of our regular co-hosts. Good morning, Colby. Good morning. Colby just popped in here like two seconds ago, so he's, <laughs> he's still getting situated, still getting set set in his chair there, I guess. And our master, one of our master gardener volunteers, Bernie. Good morning, Bernie. How are you? Good morning. I'm your token old guy, so if, if you okay. want to talk to an old guy, I'm the man. <laughs> Voice of experience. So you have to look at it on kind of a positive level. And I'm joining us, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> And we got a special guest star today. We have Jillian from Pasco County Extension. Good morning, Jillian. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you guys? I'm great. We've never really had a chance to really work together before. I know that you emailed me about coming to help teach your Master Gardener class, which I usually do for Pasco County. Um, but other than that, I know you work in Pasco County. I know you work for Extension. I'm not sure what you do. <laughs> so I've kind of fallen into extension, um, but I get to help manage and work with the Master Gardener vo volunteers here in Pasco. Okay. So do you get to answer a lot of questions there also? Um, just mostly for them. Uh, I don't have much of a horticulture background. Um, I've got some of the kind of basic science biology information from my undergrad, which was in marine science. So can kind of make the connections there. Um, but we really rely heavily on Jim Mull, our Florida Friendly Coordinator, and Kate Kaste. Her, uh, she's the um, program manager for Florida Friendly. And then of course, Dr. Elmore is our extension director and she's a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Yes, she is. She's been on here before. I need to get a hold of her and have her back on here again. Yeah, rope her in. Yeah, yeah. No, Whitney's a great guest on here. And, of course, for anybody watching us live, if you have any questions at all, lawn and garden, um, cold weather, water, whatever it might be, go ahead and put them in the chat, and we'll show the questions and get them answered. And if you're watching a recording of this, Go ahead and put your questions in the comments. And I try my best to go back after the fact and see if there's any questions on there and answer them. Or contact our office. We're going to have all of our contact information at the very end here. But yeah, looks like Bernie has a fan. And Buddy, who is one of our regular followers, he lives up in the panhandle. I was freezing this morning. And I'm, my feet oh, yeah. are still cold. Yes, I can only imagine the panhandle. <laughs> but it was in the 40s. That you just, know, that's that not just so bad. Right. Frost would be bad because I didn't put anything in. I'm on, I'm down to four plants that I protect now. And uh, that, that's it. Those, those four are in pots that I can move. And if it's going to frost, I'll stick them in the garage. But uh, everything else has either died or it's made peace with the cold because I'm not taking care of it anymore. I like that approach. I try to look at things that way, but I still have a lot of small dragon fruit plants. And if it gets too cold, I'm going to have to drag them all in. I didn't. We got down to, you know, frost on the house roofs and vehicles, no ice on the windshield. So that's good. And no frost on the grass. So I didn't suffer any damage. Two, three degrees colder could have been a very different story. I had frost on my uh, windshield yesterday in Spring Hill. It was yeah, uh, I'm not... it was, uh, Bernie saying that it that forties isn't cold. It's spoken like someone who's not from here, man. Forty <laughs> is freezing. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with forty. <laughs> well, the thing about it oh. is, at forty degrees, I can wear enough clothes. I can still move. If I was in Indiana, still in Indiana. I would have to wear enough clothes that I couldn't move anymore. So that's, that's the distinction. When when it gets to the point where you can't move around 
uh, you, you've got nine layers and that's it. Your arms are sticking straight out and, and, and it's hard to breathe and, and you can't work the accelerator anymore because your legs don't bend from the seven pairs of pants. That's cold. <laughs> oh, yeah, that I grew up in Maryland. Degrees. And when I was a kid, mm -hmm. we all had long underwear, tops and bottoms and boots and snow pants. And, oh, yeah. And I forgot that Colby was born and raised here in Florida. So, yeah, anything below 40 is going to kill you. Oh, it, it, it's bad. I mean, it, well, what Bernie's talking about is me when it gets to be about 45. I'm like, this is it. Or it, it's it's the dead of winter. It never gets colder than this. You know, it's terrible. I don't I know what I do somewhere bad. else. Anything below 40s is really, really cold for me. And Bassem points out Cuban oregano will be one of those herbs that will die from the freezing temperatures. Oh, yes, it will be because I have a large one growing in a pot in the backyard. During the summer, it does great. It loves it when it's 100 degrees and it rains all day, 100% humidity. I get a ton of Cuban oregano off of it. I haven't had a chance to go out there and take a close look at it, but it did not look well the other morning. So Cuban oregano, very sensitive to the cold. Very good to grow. Anybody else here ever try Cuban oregano in anything? Mm -mm. Oh, it's great. It's It tastes just like oregano. You can dry it so you can make your own dried Cuban oregano to save from having to buy the dried oregano at the grocery store. And if you ever make any Cuban recipes, either Cuban uh, pork roast or black beans and rice, it's essential in that. Is and there the stuff grows sausage? like a weed during the summer. Is there a Cuban sausage that uh, they use it to flavor? You know, I, Italian uh, food, the Italian sausage, the oregano is, is what makes that sausage. And it is, yeah. is there a Cuban sausage that goes the same way? You don't know. I'm not positive. I know chorizo, I think, is more Mexican cuisine yeah. than Cuban, although it may be used in both. Why do we keep wandering off into cooking recipes on the show? <laughs> it really have plays to well. <laughs> what are most we're going to have to do a cooking in. special. We, we can't talk about sex, and, and the only thing left is food and, and a few hobbies. Food, invasive animals. We're still um, supposed to have a guest on to talk about invasive animals because I know the question came up a few weeks ago about trying to keep coyotes or keeping big cats. I think Colby said he knew somebody that had a couple of Florida Panthers as pets. <laughs> I, mm, I'm, I don't. Go ahead. I've, I've heard of people doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to the best of my knowledge, that is not allowed. <laughs> you have to permit out like all of that stuff. I think that's what we determined was that you have to permit. It's like permit, permit, permit. There is. I think even Tegu lizards now you have to have a permit for. I think they have to be chipped also. The the rules on big cats have changed. There's there's federal rules now uh, that pretty well prohibit getting any of the cats so uh the, a lot of the other animals aren't too bad uh, i really wanted uh some lemurs and uh, you you have to have a, a special veterinarian sign for it and, and it they make it not impossible but they make it so difficult you have to really be serious if you want to do it where on the cats they they try to make it impossible uh although i never saw it apparently there was a tv show with some idiot that had a bunch of uh, wild cats and, and mistreated them, didn't take good care of it, and uh, it created enough outrage that the feds uh, passed uh, some really nasty ordinances. Uh, I was going to say some that the legislators, it's, the show's called Tiger King. They must have watched it during the pandemic. Got, got yeah, uh, I think we all did. Got real inspired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, the, 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 the lady from that show, like that thing was in Tampa, the, uh, yep, yep. the big, the big cat sanctuary. I, I never, I, I've seen it. I've driven by it, but I've never been to it. I, 
it just seems like when you put those big animals, like things that are not meant to live in the house or live in captivity, you put them in there, there's no way that their health nor their like actual quality of life, what they enjoy is in there. So I, I don't understand yeah. it. Very sad. I had a, a friend with a big male lion and he got it when it was uh, a very small cat. And he, he said the, the most difficult thing in the training was that he had to be able to take anything away from the lion. And uh, so he would give it a steak and then he would take it away. And of course, he's wearing leather up to his elbow or up to his armpits and, and leather jacket and everything because his cat really didn't like it. And, and eventually it got to the point where he could pretty well do anything with the cat. They had a really nice enclosure all, all caged and uh, the, the cat could go in and out and it had a, a, a protected area outside. And they would use tires for something for it to do to, to play and and that lion could tear up a car tire and in a day's time they, they would give it a, a tire that was all nice and pretty and at the end of the day it was nothing but always a little uh, a metal hoop from the, the where the rims are and, and and cloth pieces sticking out and treads of, of tread and i like you know to have an animal like that you have to really be nuts because it, it would have taken that, that animal two seconds to kill anybody so well, I, i've seen what my cat can do to a pair of socks and he weighs 11 pounds so i can only imagine what a what a uh you know a 800 pound tiger or whatever however big they are can do natural instinct i guess uh, oh yeah yeah that whole take you have to be able to take it away i'll I'll pass on that part. <laughs> I'm not taking anything from from a, a lion. That's a hard pass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yes, we're, we're going to get some guest speakers <laughs> on on animals and invasive animals because I'm not the expert on that. And we'll try to get more guests on here to be able to answer whatever kind of questions you have, whatever comments you have. Um, Amory lives north of us. She lives in the one county that's at the very northern, up in the panhandle, it butts up against Georgia. So she almost lives in Georgia. And she had to pluck off all the peppers. Probably a good idea when it comes to the, and a lot of us have peppers and tomatoes and maybe squash or other things in the garden that are still growing. You can keep them out there. But when you get a really bad freeze, they're going to freeze and die. So they're not going to last forever. Their time is limited, but feel free to keep them growing and continue getting peppers for a little bit longer, tomatoes, whatever it might be. If you ever hear that you're going to get a really bad freeze that night, go out and pick all that stuff off the afternoon before the freeze because tomatoes, peppers, and a lot of other warm season vegetables, they turn to mush. So the day, the morning after a freeze, if you have tomatoes, the tomatoes all fall off the plants and they all turn to mush. So pick them the day before and enjoy your last little bit of harvest there. And Buddy, Buddy, who is our uh, friend up in the panhandle with vanilla plants, he had to move all the vanilla plants inside. Yeah, they're tropical. They don't like cold. Mangoes, for anybody who has mangoes, they get unhappy below 50 they get really unhappy below 40. So it doesn't have to be 33 or 32 for certain plants to be very unhappy. Yeah, Amory lives up in Madison County. So that's so we have people from all over the state here. I and if you have any questions from anywhere in the state, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll we'll give it our best shot to answer them. No, that, that taking the, the uh, peppers making stuffed peppers and freezing them. Man, those those things, that, that's one that microwaves for a quick meal really nicely. So mm -hmm. uh, that that would be a, a great thing to have. The only problem I can see is with what a hamburger costs nowadays. Uh, you're looking at a, a loan to uh, buy enough hamburger to stuff more than about a half a dozen peppers. So. Yeah, unfortunately, it adds up. Oh, and she even had ba bananas up there. So you can grow. 
Bananas do just fine all the way up into North Florida during the summer because it's hot and steamy and bananas like that. But when it gets really cold, all bets are off. Boy, and chestnuts also. Um, you should have pecans up there that far north. I know really north of Gainesville. They grow pecans and they'll sell them along the side of the road out in the countryside. Here in Central Florida, um, pecans don't do all that well. They're short-lived. And did anybody hear that they changed the planting zones? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bernie is ready. Bernie is prepared, I tell you what. <laughs> I, I keep that just to show people. I, I the, the problem is this covers... The, the the normal zone thing, but there's another one that covers the uh, just the high temperature areas, and it's it's amazing how the the zones are are not really the same when you're looking at uh, year round versus the the hot only, and uh, I, the I I see it a, a problem in that uh, Hernando County is now nine B, but the truth is we get occasional zone eight winters you know every every five to seven years we get a zone eight winter and uh often we get zone 10 summers so uh, mm -hmm. you you have to to be very very careful you know it, it, it's it's great that we're 9b but the the truth is if if you need plants that are going to survive you want plants that uh, are zone eight to ten so just just buying plants that are rated to zone 9b you're probably going to lose them every five or six years anyway yeah and another problem with those zones is people will buy plants out of catalogs not having a really good idea about what's going to do well in their part of florida where they live and they see um a variety of cherry tree that grows in 9a or 9b and they, oh, I love cherries. I'm going to order this, and it's not going to, it's not going to flower and get, give you cherries here in Florida, because if you look at the map for the whole country, there's parts of 9A and 9B in Texas, and in California, and our weather is totally different from California weather. The summers are totally different. The winters are pretty different. So you really need to follow University of Florida recommendations for what is going to do best in your part of Florida. You can't just go by, you know, if the catalog says it's 9B and I live in 9B, I'm good to go. Maybe, maybe not. That's not an absolute. You know, we when were I was looking, oh, go ahead, Bernie. We were talking before we went on the air about the, the problems with the Italian Cypress. And the, the thing that happens is if, if you're in zone 9B, in a Mediterranean climate, California, uh, you don't have any problems with with the fungus that, that we do. But uh, you you come here, and if the plant has any tendencies at all to have a fungal problem, uh, it, it's going to get stomped, smashed, and die. And and uh, it's it's really sad because there's so many inappropriate plants that are sold here that that would be perfect in Texas or, or uh, California that are not going to survive here for the long term because the humidity is so high. So the, the 9B doesn't take into account the humidity. And, and basically all those plants with, with needles or uh, like the, the Italian cypress is a problem. Leyland cypress, which they, they sold lots of in, in Florida, is a problem. Arborvitae is a problem. The, the, the one that seems to be great, and it's a native, uh, is the northern red cedars. So uh, red cedar, if you want something that, that looks like a Christmas tree, uh, they're a Christmas tree for the first 10 years. Once it starts to break and form a tree, cut it down and put in another one. Yeah, I have a neighbor that has one that's like the perfect height, I guess maybe eight feet tall, uh, in their front yard, and they had lights on it the other day so it's perfect christmas tree height they can get really large so 20 years down the road they may have to be up on a very tall ladder if they want to keep putting lights on it 
But yeah, a lot of the evergreens just do not do really well. Let's go ahead and go into Dr. Bill's email bag here for a question. Or kind of question, comment. This comes from Jim Norman, who's one of our regular um, viewers and listeners and followers. And Jim is a master gardener over in Volusia County. And he helps to work their clinic. He answers a lot of questions. And he said, it gets frustrating sometimes uh, when people email in questions and pictures because they'll just send some random pictures and go, what's wrong with my plant? <laughs> doesn't give you a whole lot to go on. Personally, I like when people, a lot of times I can figure out what the problem is, make recommendations and send them more information if they email me with a good description of what the issue is and pictures. And I always tell people there's no such thing as too many pictures. Send lots of pictures. That makes it easier for us to figure out what's going on. So I like it, but Jim finds it a little frustrating because um, sometimes it's just difficult to tell what's going on. Uh, I know that people don't always take the best pictures. I'm guilty of that. I'm not a photographer. I don't take the best pictures either, guys. But sometimes people take really blurry ones. I don't get too many with, you know, the thumb in front of the <laughs> lens or anything. Every once in a while, a little bit of a thumb. But um, he, let me go ahead and share uh, some pictures here that he sent. And somebody sent pictures of an Italian cypress. And they said, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with my plant? And that doesn't give you a whole lot to really work with. Here you see the trunk. I see lots of brown, dead um, leaves, needles, white stuff on the trunk, which is an indication of a fungus. And then this picture here, uh, you can kind of see some white stuff. Let me go on the trunk there also. But neither one is, they're both helpful, but not really helpful. So a lot of times from pictures, we cannot tell you specifically exactly what that fungus is. That's why University of Florida has a plant disease clinic and samples can be sent off to them and they plate them out. They put them in a, a incubator. They look under a microscope and they tell you exactly what the fungus is. I can just give you an idea. But I think in this situation, the first thing that I would have looked at is Italian cypress, ding, red flag. Italian cypresses do not do well in Central Florida. Some, sure, some can. Somebody's going to come on here and say, I have a neighbor that has two of them by their front door, and they're both beautiful. And they can be, but not forever. They have a lot of problems. They can be difficult to grow. And they may do well for a while, for a number of years. They may get start to get tall. What happens is, like Bernie mentioned earlier, they get spider mites. And now you have dead spots. They'll have a little chunk that turns brown and it looks unsightly, you know, by your front door. They're just, they're problematic. They're really difficult to grow. Pick something that's easy to grow and you don't have to put a lot of time and effort and chemicals and water and fertilizer and other things into it. So do you like me and take the easy way out. <laughs> and, and quit planting. Jillian, things. do you have any really difficult food. to grow plants in your yard? What do you have growing in your yard? You know, I have these giant oaks, live oaks, so they kind of shade everything else out. Mm -hmm. um, but they're doing great. They look really healthy. Um, we try to keep them, you know, pruned back away from the house a little bit so none of those giant branches fall. But otherwise, we keep it simple. See, if it was me, I'd order about 200 caladium bulbs and put them in and call it a day, and my landscaping is done. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the research they're doing with caladiums. That's awesome. They are, and it, I believe either all or the vast majority of caladiums that are sold in the U.S. are grown in Florida. We grow a ton of them here. And they're always trying to develop new colors and new looks. And there's a lot of variety out there. Nice thing about caladiums is no maintenance. They come up in the spring. They're going to do what they're going to do during the summer. They disappear in the fall. And they don't need any help from you. <laughs> Those are the best kind of plants. <laughs> yes, they are. I like things like that. 
Uh, Julian, with the population expansion that you're getting in Pasco, are, are you short master gardeners now? Do you Could you use more people? We are always open for more. Um, we are, since I'm a little bit newer into the game, we're kind of creating some culture shifts that way. You know, they're getting more involved. We've got about 80 master gardeners right now, um, which is great, but I'm always happy with more. You've got a, a unique situation in that uh, the eastern half of the county and the western half of the county are just two totally different environments. It's, yes. They're mm -hmm. almost two different zones and, and everything mm -hmm. else that went with it. <laughs> yeah, our coastal area is, um, I believe, now 10A, and then the rest of it's 9B. And then just because of how long we are, we do have master gardeners who kind of like to stay regional. So we have kind of our west side group and our east side group and 41 is kind of our line in the middle and we have some who refuse to cross either direction. So <laughs> it always keeps us good regionally because they are all over, but then sometimes makes getting more in a little bit more difficult because we do our training on the east side in Dade City. So they kind of have to make that crossover if they want to go yeah. through the whole training. Yeah. Yeah, it's I so know that, um, and I know Tarpon Springs is in Pinellas County, but it's just over the line from Pasco. Yes. It's, mm -hmm. you know, ball toss from Pasco County. And I learned not that long ago, they grow a ton of mangoes over there. Oh, well, I didn't know that. grow mangoes, apparently, in Tarpon Springs. And if it, if that has, Bernie, look on your map. Do you think Tarpon Springs is now 10? Or at least close to ten. It is. It's it's ten. Good. Wow. I'm jealous. They can grow mangoes, and mine are still gonna freeze here in Spring Hill. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, ten starts at about two thirds of the way up on the coast on Pasco, and it's <laughs> like a triangle and goes down and, yeah. and picks up. Uh, all around the uh, Tampa Bay, so yeah, uh, yeah, and and it's amazing. You know, Orlando is ten degrees warmer than we are. Uh, yeah, and and they're slightly farther north. That it's very confusing because things that you can do in Orlando don't quite work here. And uh, uh, if if you go over to Lou Gardens and you look at all the things, the the stuff that is just barely hanging on in Lou Gardens that you, man, I'd love to have that. Uh, you really can't. That 10 degrees is, is a dramatic difference. It's like a whole different world. You know, the, people don't understand that, but it, it's when, when you start talking about the topography in Florida, we have very low change, but it, it is so sensitive that, that the, the plants that grow in the first hundred feet back from a pond are, are one group of plants. And then because of the elevation change, the, the, the three feet difference after that, it's a totally different set of, of you know, the pine trees are a different variety of pine. Uh, what we would call weeds is a totally different set of, of, of plants. And uh, uh, little subtle things are very, very important. And, and when you just, move to the state and don't comprehend what's going on the first thing you do is you run out and you buy a bunch of pretty plants at, at the big box store and watch them die and and if you're stupid like maybe i was you you can spend a a, a small fortune uh buying plants and watching them die and, and pretty soon you realize this is getting stupid you know if, if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results there, there's a term for it but I, I I may have been guilty of that. Yeah, we don't want to see people get frustrated and have to go through failure after failure. You know, a lot can be learned from experience. I know from vegetable gardening and a lot of other things. You just have to do it for a while and you learn as you go. But, you know, we like to see people not make the really, really bad mistakes right off, expensive mistakes right off the bat. 
If you look, it, it, it's real interesting you mentioned that, like the topography and the differences. If you look at, you know, Brooksville, like in like downtown Brooksville versus somewhere like over by Shoreline towards Hernando Beach. And I, I'm not going to say Hernando Beach because that is a little bit of a different situation. But over that way, that there, th those are there's completely different soil types. They're not that there's stuff that you can grow in Brooksville that you that wouldn't stand a chance over there. Uh, closer to the coast and vice versa and and, the, and those places are 15 minutes apart so it's it's really uh it's really kind of interesting how that stuff works well it's interesting we to see too how much the water in interacts with that how the temperature mm -hmm. changes with how quickly it changes in land versus the ocean and vice versa yeah people who live in hernando beach the they grow they can grow much more tropical things because mm -hmm. they are right next to the water it moderates the cold but they have totally different soil and their soil their ph tends to be sky high mm -hmm. so that has an impact on what they can and cannot grow also you know you know you really don't want to try growing blueberries over there in hernando beach not going to work out well at all no. <laughs> we have a question here from Paige asking about burrowing wasps or bees, and she doesn't know if they're cicada killers that tear up the lawn each year. The yard is canal front off the Wikiwachi, and it is ruined grass in yards. So what do you think could make little holes in people's lawns that are right along a canal by the Wikiwachi? And it's possible that they are burrowing native solitary bees, but unless you see one, you can't really say for sure that it's a bee. If you walk outside and see just a lot of holes, there's a lot of different things that it could be. Um, probably not cicada killers. You're not, I mean, a lot of times bees, whether it's burrowing bee or cicada killers, they look for really bare dirt areas. They're not going to see as many of them in a lawn. And the thicker the lawn is, the fewer bees you're going to see because they like wide open, sandy, bare soil. And obviously those bees, they should all be gone right now. They're going to be gone for the rest of the winter until spring. And she said, I have seen many swarming in the mornings. They don't sting. We have a number of species of um, native bees that are very, very important for the environment. And they live in individual, single, solitary holes. There's ones that are called mining bees. So if you have a bare dirt area, you can end up with a lot of them all at once. And Paige is correct. They don't sting. Um, I would live with them. I mean, they're, they're really, they might be um, a little bit of a nuisance. But especially if you live right on a canal, you would need to be very careful about what kind of pesticides you're using. You're required to be very careful about the fertilizer you're using, when you fertilize, and if you fertilize any given spot because of Hernando County's fertilizer ordinance. So because of the fact that you're right next to a water body, I'd be very, very careful do, taking any steps to treat them. The other any thing other is... They they really are, are not damaging the lawn normally. It, it's like you say, they, they pick a bare spot and, and make the opening. So um, the, the only problem where I could see that they would be doing damage would be uh, the uh, sand sitting on top of, of the, the lawn might be a problem. But generally, if, if you just take a lawn rake, turn it over and drag it backwards, spread the sand uh the first rain those all those little holes appear to disappear so uh, i i really don't see where they they should be causing lawn damage that's that's not normal and if you are suffering a lot of times people will suffer lawn damage and since they have bees they assume it must be the bees that are causing the lawn damage so if you have Bahia lawn or Bahia, mixture of Bahia and weeds or mostly just weeds, that's going to tend to be a little bit thinner. If you have a St. Augustine lawn, it should be thick enough where you're not going to have 
any or very few bees in a St. Augustine lawn. So you want to take a hard look at exactly how you manage your yard. Are you cutting it high enough? If you're cutting it short, and when I say short, I mean two and a half inches tall, whatever you got growing out there, and Bernie and I were talking before the show today, even if you have weeds growing, cut them four inches high. Going to look better, going to grow better, going to cover the dirt better. The better you cover the dirt, the less attractive to stray bees looking to make a home it's going to be. Um, so yeah, you, you want to, if you want to contact us for information about, um, managing whatever type of turf grass you have, we can, you know, give recommendations on cutting height, when to fertilize, when to water, things like that. So that you have a really, really healthy lawn. Cause I'm surprised. You, Bernie, have you ever seen a problem with bees in a really thick St. Augustine lawn? No, it's, uh, they're almost yeah. always where the lawns thinned out. So, yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that, that I think is kind of funny is I get uh, people that, that call occasionally and, and they just moved in and they've got these snake holes in the ground around their property. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I can assure you, snakes are not equipped to dig a hole. They're, they're, uh, oh, yeah. you know, what are they digging it with? There's nothing there. They don't have any hands, feet, uh, clippers, or anything. There's just nothing. So unless they own an electric drill, they aren't doing any hole making. Yeah, that's always a tough question. I have holes in my yard. What is it? Wow, it could be a lot of different things. It could be a bee. It could be a cicada killer. It could be a mole cricket. Um it could be a variety of other um, insects. We have and those are just little beetles. holes. Yeah, those are just the little holes. So you have <laughs> to see what size hole it is. It could be ants. Ants make little holes. They make big holes. You really have to literally pull up a chair and sit there for a while and see if you can't catch the resident coming and going to at least narrow it down a little bit. Give us something to work with. I got a uh, I got your your animal fun fact of the day with those uh, so a lot of those insects those uh, including like a lot of wasp bees cicada killers the the so the males will be aggressive but cannot sting you the females have stingers can sting you but are not aggressive huh. and cicada killers I know are like that I I don't have a a lit uh, like a list but I do know that they're like that and there's a few other uh, species of those. Flying wasps, wasp and bee-like insects that have that. That's the case with. So there's your there's your biologist fun fact of the day. <laughs> I, I would think that the, the complaint on the bees killing the grass it, it's a case of the the grass is is dying off and the bees are taking advantage. Mm -hmm. of the the correlation does not equal causation. It, it, uh, you know, we we get that a lot. The, People think that, that something is killing the lawn, and uh, it, it's just, you know, I've got mo Spanish moss in my trees, and it's killing the trees. Well, the the reason that all the Spanish moss is increasing is the stupid tree is dying, and all the moss wants to do is find a place to hang out. So if the tree's healthy, it probably doesn't have any moss, and if if the tree isn't healthy, gets covered with moss, the the it may. Uh, speed up the decline of the tree but mm -hmm. that's that's not the problem the, the problem is something else and that's just a symptom that shows up after the problem and i i think that the the bees are a, a symptom after the problem yeah a symptom or secondary effects and we see that a lot a lot of times um when people look for cause and effect they get a little mixed up. I had a lady call once before and she said, um, what can I do to um, take care of the great big grasshoppers that are ruining my lawn? Okay, well, she's probably talking about lover grasshoppers because everybody flips out over lover grasshoppers, but they don't ruin lawns particularly. So I said, what kind of grass do you have? She said, behalf. I said, well, you know, why do you think that these grasshoppers are ruining or damaging your lawn? She said, well, I walked outside this morning. I looked down. I noticed that my lawn looks bad. That wasn't the word she used, but the lawn looks bad. 
And I looked and I saw a great big grasshopper sitting on the bush. So the grasshopper must have did it. Well, the grasshopper didn't do it. The grasshopper was just there. <laughs> Something else is happening with your grass to make it look bad and decline and cause problems. The, the grasshopper and the bird and the anole and the black snake and everybody else, they're all just hanging out. They're living there. They're not causing what your problem is. So well, that's what we try had to do is get to the bottom of what your actual problem mm -hmm. is and what we can do about it. I'm thinking if I had a dollar for uh, uh, every phone call I get about how watering once a week is what's making your St. Augustine lawn die. I'd, I probably wouldn't have to answer the phone calls anymore. <laughs> um. <laughs> yes. And here, let's go ahead and drive this point home. I'm going to turn everybody off so that everybody watching us can see the background. And then we'll come back on and I'll tell you what it is. So. So if you got a good look at that, that is a picture that was sent to us a couple months ago from somebody who said, I have a problem with the, you know, watering restrictions. I have to be able to water my lawn, you know, because I just fertilized it because my lawn looks bad and I fertilized it and that's going to fix my lawn. Now my lawn is going to look beautiful. And I looked at that picture. I'm like, what lawn? Why'd you put <laughs> down fertilizer? That was a waste of time and money. The fertilizer ain't going to fix that. Your lawn's dead because you've been cutting it probably about a half an inch high. And it looks like maybe once upon a time they had St. Augustine. You need to cut that four inches high. And here I even have, a, we have rulers here that show you where the four inch point is. So here's the bottom four inches is, dang, you're supposed to be cutting your grass this high. He's been shaving his down around an inch or so, and that's what killed him. Not a lack of fertilizer, not a lack of water, not grasshoppers, not anything other than that the gentleman killed his lawn. And fertilizer is not going to fix that. Uh, and violating water restrictions isn't going to fix it. And honestly, wasting water on something like that is just wasteful. That's not going to fix it either. He could wait for the weeds to come in and start cutting it high and encourage the weeds and actually have something green covering the lawn. But he needs to learn, he needs to do some reading and studying about how to manage turf grass if he wants to achieve his goal. So if anybody wants one of these rulers to remind you of exactly four inches, how high is four inches? Uh, so we, we, Bernie and I talk to a lot of people who need a little reminding and a little uh, something to measure it with. Because, Bernie, have you ever spoken to anybody where you say, you know, you need to cut your grass four inches high? And they always, always, always say, oh, we do. Yeah. And, and when you put a ruler on it, you find that the, the average four inch high lawn is an inch and three quarters. <laughs> Yep. It's, it's like the, the average stringer of, of 10 one pound bluegills weighs about six and a quarter pounds. So, so uh, the, the, the feeling is that I'm doing the right thing. The, you know, the, that's always the perception. But the truth is, uh, if, if you mow it short, it doesn't develop much of a root structure. Two inch tall lawn develops a two inch root structure. A four inch tall lawn develops an eight inch root structure or more. So the thing that happens is, uh, you know, after it rains two days later, the top two inches of soil are dry. There's still plenty of moisture in the soil, but it's down at four, five, six, seven, eight inches. So yes, your lawn is sitting there and, and it needs water, but it doesn't need water because, uh, St. Augustine has to have water every day. It needs water because you cut it too short. You know, if, if you abuse the plant, the plant's not going to like it. If a plant dies, it gets even with you because, you know, <laughs> if, if you have to budget $3,000 a year for a lawn to, to resod, 
and you're resodding every two or three years, maybe it's not the plant because there are people that don't have that problem. And, and uh, people with, with a beautiful lawn do one of two things. They either cheat and they water every day or they follow the rules. They mow it at a, a decent height and, and they have somebody taking care of it that, that goes out and looks at it and sees if there's a problem and if there's a problem, they solve it. But if, if, you, can't, if you can't go out and inspect it, you know, Everybody thinks chinch bugs are the big problem. Chinch bugs are, are a problem in some areas, but not here. We we have sprayed so much uh, pesticides over the years. There aren't any bugs of any kind left in the, the lawn. Maybe a few ants, but uh, uh, all the earwigs, all the big eye bugs, all those guys are gone. And those are the guys that eat chinch bugs. Fortunately, we killed the chinch bugs too, but if, if they ever come back, there's nothing there to stop them. But because all these commercial guys are still spraying every other day, or, you know, and where's all that chemical ended up? It's ended up in our drinking water. So uh, if, if, if you're one of these people that thinks that organic food is a good thing, uh, then you probably should also think that uh, spraying for a non-existent insect is a bad thing. And all you have to do is raise the mower to its highest possible setting. And if you're paying somebody to mow the lawn, don't pay them to mow it short. I, mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest problem is people reach a certain spot in life where they're, they're afraid of conflict. And, and the, the guy that's mowing the lawn is, is unemployed. He's, he's, from an area of the country where uh, maybe he's one of the 90 IQ guys. He's got a pickup truck. He needed to do something. He's six foot, two inches tall. He weighs 220 pounds and he punches holes in concrete blocks. And he says, I'm mowing your lawn and that's $72.50 for today. And they give him their $72.50 and he goes away and they're terrified of telling the guy, I'm not going to pay you if you don't mow it at four inches. You know, but in, if, if, if you keep mowing it short, you will keep replacing the lawn. So if, if you haven't got the courage uh, to, to tell somebody to mow it high, then expect that every every other year probably is $3,000 for a new lawn. And, and, and it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So with that said... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we don't want to see that beating, happen. We, we're beating a dead horse on this. The, people the, should just the, educate themselves and know what needs to go into managing turf grass and expect that the companies and the people that you hire and pay are going to do that and everything should work out well. What What like, is the new vegetable now for this fall? We, we, we've done all these things. The people that, that are watching this thing know pretty much all this stuff. They, they tuned in to find out what Uncle Bill is going to tell them <laughs> on how, how to produce something new for their garden. And, 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 you know, I don't blame them. You have come up with some of the neatest things. And uh, some of them have even tasted really good. So do you have any hint for today? Well, Uncle Bill tried something new this year. Um, I've grown onions before. Uh, a number of years ago, I grew uh, Texas grain oil onions from seeds and got a fantastic crop. I was I picked a bunch of Vidalia type onions and they were beautiful. They're nice big onions. Worked out really, really well. This year, I ordered little onion starts or little onion plants, and you can get them for pretty inexpensively. And they showed up in the mail the other day. I still need to plant them. But they're like green onion size at this point. And I need to take them out in the garden and plant them and water them well, fertilize them. And what's going to happen is as the days start to get longer after a certain point, the onions sense that. And they start to swell up and make onions. So I'm looking forward to hopefully having a good onion crop. I did get a really good crop of sweet potatoes. And I still have some on the ground that I need to get out there and finish digging them up. It's... It's a lot of 
your hands underneath the dirt. Because I'm not going to go out there with a shovel and chop them up and everything. I'm going to do it by hand because I don't want to damage them and bust them up. But it, it's I got quite a few sweet potatoes, guys. Easy, easy, easy crop to grow during the heat of summer where you're going to get a lot of food from it. So that's that's Dr. Bill's vegetable gardening advice for the week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of a neat thing about onions. They they tend to do well and be sweeter in areas that don't produce other crops well because the the, the less sulfur you have in the the soil, generally the sweeter the onions are. Yeah. And, uh, so the Vidalia, which you know the onions that grow there uh, have such a low sulfur that uh, they're very, very sweet onions, but it's not because it's a wonderful place. It's because it's a terrible place to grow things. So, uh, and there's some areas in Texas the same way. So if, if you have a, a plot that, that is poor soil, onions might be a great thing to try. You may turn out that, to have the ultimate perfect soil for onions because they do well where other things don't. Yeah, and they're going to do well here. As far as exactly how sweet or hot they are, it's going to vary. It really does depend on your soil in your yard. Um, but as a general rule, uh, well, obviously they do really well in Florida in the spring, usually around Easter time, like April-ish, you'll see at the farmer's markets and the produce stands, the Florida sweet onions for sale. Grow your own. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> so Jillian you guys have um some community gardens down there don't you we do we have um a, a handful of them yes okay is Chris Carrera still working there yes yeah you tell Chris I said hi because Chris I will was one of our master gardeners so I know Chris real nice guy oh cool yeah I just got to work with him and his team on Tuesday this week, we helped put a some raised beds in at a school down the road. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Have you got any programs coming up this week, Colby? Um, no, but on December 13th, we have a uh, combo, compost bin, rain barrel workshop. That's going to be at the Master Gardener Nursery, which I think... Bill, I think you have that address you could flash. Um, I thought yeah. you did. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> so we're going to – I don't know what order we're going to do them, but if you go to uh, my Facebook or my Instagram and click on that link that's there or the, on the event on Facebook, you can uh, sign up to do one, both of the compost bin rain barrel workshops. The rain barrels are $66.00. Um, you can attend the workshop for free, but if you want to leave with a rain barrel, it's $66 and the compost bins are free of charge to Hernando County residents. So, uh, um, registration is required. Registration is required because it's uh, first come first serve. If you're over, if we're over the limit, I'll send you an email telling you that we're over the limit. And, uh, <laughs> just letting you know. So, uh, please come to that. It'll be a lot of fun. You'll be very informative and you'll get to, Learn a lot, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe leave with a compost bin or a rain barrel. Those rain barrels are really nice. They come with everything that it takes. So, uh, you know, if, if you're one of these people that can follow uh, uh, instructions on paper, uh, it's pretty simple to put one together and, and fasten it into a downspout someplace or get water into the barrel. And and it, it's a great thing to have because. Rainwater not only doesn't have a bunch of bad things in it, it does have a lower pH. It, it picks up the, the carbon dioxide coming down through the atmosphere, kind of lowers its pH. And when you water things, you're not adding more uh, calcium like we do uh, when we use uh, city water or well water. So uh, you're helping to keep the pH of the, the soil great. And the plants love the lower pH of, of rainwater. So uh, things grow a lot better with rainwater than they do with tap water. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's wonderful. And they're selling them at, at basically what it costs. So uh, 
Uh, you get a hundred and fifty dollar rain barrel for sixty some bucks, and that is a good deal. And and if you're a Hernando County Utilities customer, you get a rebate as well uh, on your water bill. So uh, it is a really great program, and I'll echo what Bernie said. They're really easy, uh, easy to set up. I've done it myself uh, enough times that I know it's it's you know you're in twenty minutes and you got it. So uh, yeah, you can build your own from scratch. Yeah, That's a lot of work, um, yeah, that's, that, that's all I have, uh, all I have coming up this, uh, upcoming as of now. Okay. And I'm showing all of our contact information links. Like to remind everybody that if you would like to watch instructional things on YouTube, if you go to YouTube and look at the little search box up at the top, look up Hernando County government, they have a YouTube channel. And if you look at the different um, playlists on there, there's one for Florida Friendly Landscaping and there's one for Extension. Extension has all of my recorded classes and there's quite a few on there. Florida Friendly Landscaping. Colby, how many do you have on there? Any at this point? Uh, three or four. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, okay. I've, I, I had a, I, I missed a couple weeks and, uh, and I had a te- some technical issues and I'm trying to streamline that process, but I got a couple, mine are a lot shorter, but there are some really long form, really in-depth stuff uh, made by our previous Florida Friendly Landscaping coordinator, Lily, um, that are a wealth of knowledge. I've watched all those. I think they're super, super interesting. She has over 100 classes. Yeah, I don't have 100 on there. there. You can <laughs> you binge it. watch for, I'm, I'm gonna, one day when I'm bored, if that ever happens, I'm gonna go add up the times for all her videos and figure out if you binge watch them back to back, how long does it take to watch them all? It's I'm it's, it's quite out. some time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good weekend. So give yourself a good education there. And if you guys have any questions for Jillian, is that your correct email address? That's correct. Yep. Very good. So if you're interested in becoming a Pasco County Master Gardener, you have any questions about Pasco County Extension, any of their classes, activities, if you want to learn Jim Mall's home phone number so you can call him on the weekends with questions, he's more than happy to help. Always. You can tell him I said I'll, I'll probably get an email from him today. <laughs> tell Jim I said hi also. I haven't spoken with him in a while. I, I need to get him back on here also. Yeah. Get rope in everybody. <laughs> okay, let's see if we have any last minute comments or questions here. Um Paige has a question. Do you still get a water credit for rain barrel? We do. So you are offered, they've changed it a couple of times. I think the current rebate is $30. Uh, if you are a Hernando County Utilities customer, if you have city water, you get a credit for your rain barrel. Uh, when you come, you'll fill out, if you sign up for uh, the workshop, you'll fill out a rebate form that I'll give you. I'll sign it, you'll sign it. And uh, that'll be processed by our folks downstairs here, and it'll be applied to your bill. Good deal. You can't beat that. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you're very welcome. So, um, hey, Jillian, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. We're going to have to have you come back along with everybody else one by one from Pasco County. You know, I can get 10 people on the screen. (laughs) <laughs> the boxes yeah. get really small, but we can have a lot of people on here. I like it. And for everybody watching us live, thank you so much. Be sure to join us again next Thursday at 10 a.m. I'm going to be here, I think. Everybody else going to be here? I'm going to plan on it. Well, Jillian I'll be here. <laughs> okay, someone will be here next <laughs> Thursday. And if you're watching a recording of this, Please, if you have any questions, uh, plant-related, garden, lawn, whatever it might be, get a hold of us. Um, scroll back through the video to where we show the email addresses. Reach out to us. Send us pictures. And we're here to help you out and answer your questions. Uh, and with that, guys, thanks so much. We'll see you all again next week. Bye. Thanks.